This is the first of a series of videos I'm going to be doing on the general topic of economics and the rainbow movement. The anatomy of civil society is provided by political economy. Marx wrote, my inquiry led me to the conclusion that neither legal relations nor political forms could be comprehended, whether by themselves or on the basis of the so-called general development of the human mind, but that on the contrary, they originate in the material conditions of life, the totality of which Hegel, following the example of English and French thinkers of the 18th century, embraces within the term civil society, and that the anatomy of this civil society, however, was to be sought in political economy. The totality of relations of production constitute the economic structure of society, the real foundation on which arises a legal and political superstructure and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. The mode of production of material life conditions the general process of social, political and intellectual life. It therefore follows that if we want to address political and social movements, whether in the past or in the present, we have to inquire into their relationship to the material production of life. Now, any given society will contain a combination of forms of economy. For example, in 1921, Lenin wrote the following. What elements actually constitute the various socio-economic structures that exist in Russia at the present time. Let's enumerate these elements. 1. Patriarchal, i.e. to a considerable extent natural, peasant farming. 2. Small commodity production. 3. Private capitalism. 4. State capitalism. 5. Socialism. Russia is so vast and so varied all these different kinds of socio-economic structures are intermingled. That is to say, you cannot understand a given society in terms of there only being one economic structure. There are always several different economic structures interacting. If we look at Britain today, we have domestic economy within households. You have some people engaged in petty commodity production, small traders, hairdressers, etc. You have the capitalist sector of the economy. And you have a semi-socialist sector, for instance, the National Health Service and perhaps the state schools. It used to be considerably larger, but now it has shrunk. I'm going to focus on the domestic economy and the capitalist economy because these are the key to understanding the social movements that we're looking at. So what is a domestic economy? Let's look at how the domestic economy is different from capitalism. The first point is that the output of the domestic economy is consumed in kind within the household. That is the point that Lenin made. Second point is that labour performed within the domestic economy is unpaid. Third point, and this is the most important, is that the domestic economy does produce human beings. It doesn't just produce material goods, it produces people. And historically, we know the domestic economy could exist and did exist without a capitalist economy. Now, if we contrast that to the capitalist economy, the outputs of production are now sold as a commodity for anonymous social consumption. Those who produce goods have no direct personal or family connection to those who consume them. And as such, the only way in which production and consumption can be linked is via sale as a commodity. The labour that takes place is waged labour, not unpaid labour. Third point, it does not produce human beings. 
And the fourth point, it has never existed without a domestic economy and cannot exist except in conjunction with a domestic economy. Now, let's look at what used to be done domestically. If we go back in some areas in, in Scotland, a hundred years, some areas longer than that, you would have had grain, potatoes, vegetables, milk and fish produced in the domestic economy. If you consider what was going on on the islands. Fuels such as firewood and peat was being produced in the domestic economy. Wool fabrics, whether knitted or woven, were produced in the, the domestic economy. Obviously, cooked food, including baked food, direct care of small children, maintenance, tidying of the home, etc. Now, all that's left of that for most of the domestic economy is the part that's in italic and white. The rest has been lost to the domestic economy. It has shifted. The relations of production were such that there was no wage labour. But work tended to be divided into what was seen as men's work and women's work. And men's work was supposedly heavy but in reality, it's almost certainly the case that women worked harder, as this image of peat cutting taken from a, or based on a photograph that was taken in the early 20th century on the island of St Kilda shows. The men are standing around, they've cut some peat, and the women are setting off, carrying huge heavy baskets of it. Now, St Kilda is a very remote island. It was the most remote of the Scottish islands, so remote and isolated that in the 1930s it was evacuated as it was regarded impossible to maintain what was now seen as civilised life on such a remote outpost. Now I'm a Maclean on my mother's side and our family, at the grandparents' generation, came from the next island in, Scarp or one of the next islands in. Scarp itself met the same fate as St Kilda. It had a population of some hundreds at the start of the 20th century. By the late 1960s it was down to my uncle's family and one other family and the island was evacuated. When I used to visit it as a child in the 1960s. That point I made about how hard the women had to work is borne out by the fact my great aunt, who was, must have been in her 70s or perhaps her 80s, was still walking up onto the hill to milk the cows every day. And as a child I was astonished that if you got milk that was fresh from the cow it would be sour by the late afternoon. And the place was so primitive that there are no toilets, you just went and did your business in the heather. Now, what were the property relations in such a society? Well, the, pro the direct producers didn't own the land. Lairds did. And if the crofters hunted, this would count as poaching, but this didn't stop it happening. And this was typical of a patriarchal economy internationally. Labour was organised by relationship. For example, a man and his cousins might crew a fishing boats. And not only did the women work longer, but in a patriarchal peasant economy, it's generally the case that the patriarch sells the harvest. That is to say, he sells what's the combined result of the labour of the whole family. And that becomes the property of the man. A relic of this was the inability of women to own their own bank accounts, for example, until the mid-20th century. Now, as capitalism advanced, the domestic economy retreated. The economy as a whole was no longer based on the sexual division of labour, but on waged work. But memories of the domestic economy remained 
And you can see this in that you had a labour movement whose founders still remembered family corporation. And they used terms like brother and sister to emphasise solidarity against employers. And as wage workers, men and women became formally equal. But in reality, they were unequal. And I'll focus on that in the next video.